we have a uh, you know a program written in C. The main doesn't do a whole lot, but this time main is different. You know, it's special because main has a local variable x here. So we actually have to investigate how do we allocate for the local variable x in main. So main is being treated more or less like a real subroutine in this case, and we can do that. Okay, we can actually treat treat main ex, you know exactly like a subroutine. But the more fun, the, the more interesting part is the uh, function called diff. It has two parameters, uh, min of n and also subtrahend. You know they refer to the two, two different parts of subtraction. Uh, it has a local variable called result, and in the function diff on line six, result is uh, min of n minus you know, subtrahend, and then we return result itself as the return value of diff. So this program really doesn't do a whole lot. Okay, yeah, you can probably expect if you run it in C, um, x ends up with a value of six, and then we have a return zero in main. So let me kind of pause and make sure that you know I can answer all the questions regarding the C code before we transition to the assembly code. Do we have any questions about the C code in this case? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, all right, so we're gonna go forward to implement this whole thing in assembly code. So when we implement this whole thing in assembly code, we're gonna do a few things that are slightly different from before. So it is an extension to what we have done before. It's just you know, that we are changing things up a little bit here. <clears throat> we still have to start with no up because I have the intention to uh, keeping track of the trace of the execution of the program. So in order to do that, we have to start with a no op instruction, and then we still pretend that we are initializing the stack pointer. Um, line two does not need to be here at all, because when the processor starts, um, all the registers start off with a value of zero to begin with. So line two is more of a documentation thing. It's like, oh yeah, we are initializing the stack pointer to zero, even though it is zero to begin with already. <clears throat> so this time we're gonna change things up a little bit, and I'm just calling main. I'm calling main as if it is just a regular subroutine. It's not any special compared to other subroutines. So now we are going to call you know, um, a function, you know, call main in this case. So before, we always use a label to designate the point where the function has to return to. We're going to change that a little bit, okay? Because having to define you know, those labels every single time is tedious. So what we'll do this time is, is we're using a special feature of the assembler where it is possible to refer to the current location of the instruction and add an offset to it to become a constant. I'll explain that in just a little bit, okay? So we're just gonna do this, um, and then do the, we do the usual stuff of you know, pushing the value of A on the stack, like so. So at this point, um, I am expecting people to look at line five and six and recognize that together, we are pushing the value of register A on the stack. Okay, because you know that's something that we have introduced for about a week already. So at this time, I do expect people to understand that line five six together is pushing the value of a, and a I claim is the return address. Okay, so we are gonna check it out a little bit here, <clears throat> and then we do a jmpi to um, main. Okay, so we're calling main. So call main here, and when main returns, we get back to this location. We'll just put a halt instruction here. So this code is different from all of the other code that we have gone through already, because main is treated as a regular function. It's no different from any other function. It has a caller, okay? The caller is basically uh, from line six all the way to line seven, I suppose. Um, so it has to go through the same you know, stuff as returning. <clears throat> so now the question is focus, so now we focus our attention on line Four, okay, what is the dot six plus doing? So there are two th concepts that we have to understand here. The first one is about the dot, okay? What is the dot representing? So how many people have read the assembler manual? Nobody. So we are all kind of the people who would put together IKEA furniture without reading anything, only to find out, what are these spare parts? How come I got screws left over? Right, okay, <laughs> all right. So the dot notation is, it is the address of the opcode on the same line. That is what the dot is representing. 
So in this case, on line four, the dot is representing the address of the LDI opcode itself. Okay, so that's one thing. Do we understand what the dot is representing? More or less, okay. Um, in other words, okay, the usual way that we define a label is really using the dot as the value that the labels are defined to. So <clears throat> what about the six plus? So dot six plus is the post fixed notation of what we usually understand as dot plus six. Okay, it is a reversed Polish notation, RPN, where you specify the values to operate on first, then you specify what you plan to do with those values. So it's the opposite order of, I shouldn't say opposite, but it's different from the infix notation. We can talk about that just a little bit more too. Now the question is, why are we adding six to the opcode of the LDI instruction? That becomes the next question. So <clears throat> the way we're gonna do this is to say, what are the bytes on this particular line? Well, we have dot plus zero on this line. We have dot plus one on this line because the LDI instruction picks up two bytes. Because it needs one byte for the opcode itself, it needs one additional byte for the immediate value, you know, which is, you know, in this case, you know, the, the, um, the right-hand side of the comma. The next instruction is a decrement. It takes up only one byte. So the location of the decrement D instruction, if I continue to use the dot to mean the address of the LDI instruction, so that would be dot plus two. ST instruction also only takes one byte, so this would be dot plus three. The JMPI instruction takes up two bytes, so this would be dot plus four and also dot plus five, which means the halt instruction is now dot plus six. That is why, you know, when we add six to the address of the LDI instruction on line four, we end up with the address of the halt instruction. Okay. Are we understanding these concepts? If not, you have to let me know which part is not connecting. No questions? Okay, all right. So in order to test this program, I'm gonna put main here. And the only thing main is going to return is to, is to do is to return. So we're just gonna say main is gonna do <coughs> return. So the the three instructions for returning from a subroutine, I'm also expecting everyone to understand it now. It is a LD, you know, use one of the four, uh, three registers, you know, A, B, or C. I'm gonna choose to C just for the heck of it. Um, increment D to deallocate that byte, and then JMPC to continue execution at the, uh, back to the caller. Okay, so right now main is not doing what it is supposed to be doing here, it's simply returning but I can test the program now, okay? So the whole idea is I want to see what is going on with the assembler when they assemble this program. I also want to see what is happening when we run this program, okay? So that's why, you know, I'm just gonna leave the program like this and then use my fancy tool called a River Spider, okay? It's GISP310 River Spider because this saves me a lot of work, you know, having to copy and paste and then, you know, do all kinds of import and stuff like that. So we'll just go ahead and do it this way. The program is called local.ttpasm because the idea is to demonstrate your local variables or how to uh, utilize local variables. So local.ttpasm. So now it's gonna do all the work for me. <clears throat> copying, copying, copying and pasting the code into the assembled, into the source tab of the assembler, um, downloading the RAM file, running it in logic sim and then re-uploading the trays um, back to the raw uh, trace raw data tab and then so now i can be but now we can actually just look at the actual trace or the analysis tab of the assembler so uh, we got too many tabs open but it should be this one i believe there we go <clears throat> so if you want to sign in to um, your account you can actually make a snapshot of the assembler at this point, you know, so that you don't have to kind of copy and paste the code and you know, later on you'll know, do your own exper experimentation. So let's take a look at this code here. There are a few things that are noteworthy. The first one is go to the assemble tab. So when we get to the assemble tab, we want to focus on the dot six plus notation and say, 
why is the dot six plus a nine? Well, that's because the LDI instruction is at location three, and we're adding three to we're adding six. Sorry, we're adding six to the three, and that's why we end up with a nine. But is nine is zero nine the correct location for the function to return to? So nine is the address of the halt instruction, which is right after the JMPI instruction. So that means you know I did specify the correct return address, you know, after main is done with what it's supposed to do. All right, so I want to pause here just to make sure that we are okay with the concepts that we that I have been talking about, which is the dot notation. And then the six plus is a reverse Polish notation. So it's just a different way of expressing um, an expression. Uh, it's, it's a different way to formulate an expression, a mathematical expression. Whew. Okay, are we good so far? Yep. Why is there a dot plus zero? A dot plus zero? Oh, you mean here? Yeah. That's just comment. You know, that's basically just me commenting it. And <clears throat> because um, this is dot plus zero, this is dot plus one, dot plus two, dot plus three, dot plus four, dot plus five. This is dot plus six, where the dot is referring to the start address of the LDI instruction. So that's why I use the you know, dot plus zero here, because it is basically dot plus zero is the 6C byte, which is the opcode, which is at the address of zero three. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Sorry? Yes. So basically main is no different from any other subroutine now which is the proper way to look at it. Yep. All right, any other questions? So the only new concept I have introduced up to this point is the notation of reverse Polish notation, dot six plus, and the concept of the dot referring to the address of the opcode on the same line. So those are the only concept, new concepts at this point. Everything else, are being being recycled from the previous two classes. <clears throat> so shall we move forward? Okay. So getting moving forward, okay, yeah, we are just going to take a quick look at the analysis tab, which is basically following the instruction execution. So we have the no op instruction, doesn't do a single thing, fine. We have LDI D0, so D ends up with a value of zero, even though it had zero already, that's okay. We just say, okay, fine, we're updating it to zero now. Um, and then we have LDIA with dot six plus and dot six plus as we as we uh, demonstrated a little bit earlier, you know, gives us a value of nine. So A ends up with a value of nine, and then we push nine onto the stack, which involves you know, decrementing the stack pointer first and then storing the value to where the stack pointer is pointing to. So and we end up with an update of location FF, and that location now has the content of zero nine. Uh, the stack pointer became you know, FF because we decremented first and it started off with a value of zero to begin with. And then we do a JMPI to the subroutine, which is main in this case. At main, the, the only thing we do is to return, which consists of popping the return address. So this is the first operation of a pop, which is to retrieve the value where the stack point is pointing to and put it into a register, register C in this case. So now register C has a value of zero nine, and then we adjust the stack pointer because this is a pop operation, which means the location where we just read from should be deallocated. And to do that, we are incrementing the stack pointer. So the stack pointer goes back up to zero, zero. And then the last instruction of the function main is a JMPC, which means we are copying register C to the program counter. So that's why you know, the execution continues on at location zero nine which then you know, just, just a halt instruction. It doesn't do a single thing. We are now at the end of the execution of this program. Whew. So are we good so far with this code? Okay. Um, so if you want to, you know, this is kind of your last chance to do a file and then go to uh, make a copy so you can take a snapshot of this program as it is right now because I'm gonna add more instructions later. So when I, when I test run the program again, this is all gonna be updated. So if you want to take a snapshot right now, you'll go to the spreadsheet, 
and just go to file and then make a copy and then just copy it to your own folder. I would name it, okay, you'll make sure that you name it you know, in a certain way so that you know what it is about. Um, one way to name it, okay, this is something that I would, I'm just suggesting, is to name it after today's date and also with a time on it, okay? Because that way, when you look at the file, you automatically know where to look in the video that talks about this particular snapshot of the program. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. It makes sense to me. <clears throat> but, I, but then I have been told what makes sense to me does not make sense to other people. <clears throat> All right, so now we continue with our discussion. So this will stay the same until I run the program again, so you still got a little bit more time to take a snapshot. <clears throat> All right, so we'll do a, uh, we'll go back and edit the program again. All right, so now in main, I got a few things to do. So what I need to do is to say, okay, what does the stack look like from the perspective of the code in main? The first thing is we have a return address, okay? That, that's something that's a given because main is just a regular subroutine. But then I also want to allocate you know, the space for a local variable, which is x in this case. So by the time everything is allocated, this should be what the stack looks like, okay? We have the return address taking up the higher byte, and then we have x as a local variable taking up, quote unquote, the lower byte. But this does not happen by itself, okay? Because a subroutine, a function, is responsible to allocate its own local variables. The caller can, has no idea, okay, how much, how many bytes the, lo, the, sub, the function needs as its local variables. So it is up to the uh, function to allocate for its own local variable. So in this case, since we only have one, we can just say decrement D to allocate, okay, allocate for local variable x, local var x. But then later on, before I return, I better you know, balance the stack and deallocate, deallocate local variable x before I return. So all the code in between now has the return address being one byte after where the stack pointer points to, because now on line 15, the stack pointer points to the local variable x, which is not initialized at this point. Are we doing okay so far with this? Yes, no, maybe. All right, <clears throat> since there are, I'm gonna, I can wait a little bit longer if you want to spend some time to think about what you want to ask, so that's fine too. No questions, all right. So if there are no questions, I'm going to change the program just a little bit, just so that we can kind of see what, how do we access the local variable. So we're going to do, um, I'm going to comment out this line here, comment out line 13 so it doesn't call the function. And instead I just say, for no particular reason, I want to in initialize x to be 17. Okay, that's all I want to do. So now how do we do that? You might say, Hmm, we don't have to do much because the stack pointer really is pointing to x right now. So we just have to copy the value of 17 to where the stack pointer is pointing to. Yeah, you can do it that way. I mean, it's not wrong. It may not be the best practice of programming, but it's not wrong in this case. So in order to do that, I just have to you know, use one of the other registers, A, B, or C, and say, let's put 17 into local, I mean, register A, and then we do a st to where the stack pointer points to with a. Because you know, where the stack pointer is pointing to right now is indeed the local variable. So before I run this program, I want to kind of go through the simulation in my head. Is where exactly is the return address when I run this code? Where do you think you should expect the return address? We saw that earlier, actually. We saw that earlier in the previous trace. What is the address of the return address? Mm -hmm. um, give me the exact location, like, you know, FD, FA, or FF, that's right, okay. 
So we already know that the return address is stored at location FF. So that means X should be at location FE. That is correct. So when we run this program on the right-hand side in TTP ASM, we should expect FE to get the value of decimal 17, which is in hexadecimal 11. Because 17 is 1 times 16 plus 1, and therefore in hexadecimal, it is 1, 1. Okay? So this is how we test the concepts, is we kind of anticipate what the program is supposed to do, and then we check to make sure the program does do what we think it should do. Okay, so we'll go ahead and test it. Okay, so I can, I just have to make sure I save the file first, and then go to the <clears throat> tool, and we just resubmit the code. And then we just kind of let it do its thing. Sometimes it takes longer because you know, this is actually being done on Google side. Okay. This is also being done on the Google side. All right. So now that everything is done, we go back to the assembler <clears throat> and look at the execution of the program. Um, the only thing we did, or the only thing we changed, is what we did, what we did in what we are doing, sorry, what we are doing inside main. So the first thing we do in main this time is to decrement the stack pointer. The stack pointer is now down to FE, and then we put 17 into register A, which means you know, we put 1, 1 in hexadecimal into register A, and then we store register A to where it's register D is pointing to, and this is, the, this is the proof. We have just initialized local variable X to 1, 1 in hexadecimal, which is 17 in decimal. So, and I'm also expecting the stack to be balanced, which means by the, by the program, by the time the program halts, I expect you know, D to be back to zero, zero, and that's exactly the case. D is back to zero, zero, which means I balance the use of the stack before I get to the halt instruction at the very end of the program. All right, so the difference between this program and the previous one is I just demonstrated how to allocate for local variables, and also how to access my local variable. So I'll be okay with both of those concepts. Okay, all right. So if you want to take a snapshot of this program, you can do so now. You know, I'm going to back to change the source code, but it's not gonna reflect in the spreadsheet for a while. So if you want to, if you want to take a snapshot, you know, now is a good time to take a snapshot. <clears throat> And while you're doing that, I'm going back to this program, and I'm reverting back to the original C code. So I'm going back to the C code and go like, okay, this wasn't there before, to begin with. This is what we want to do. And then we come back here. We take out you know, that one. Okay, so we basically say, okay, we are not putting 17 into register, into local variable X. We have to call the subroutine now. So in order to call div using the caller callee agreement, what do we need to do? We talked about that on Tuesday. So what do we do when we call a subroutine with arguments in this case? What, what, what kind of stuff do we need to push and what, in what order are we pushing those particular items? We start with arguments and since there are two, which one do we push first? The rightmost, which is the last argument. That is correct, okay? So we push the arguments in reverse order, then we push the return address, then we perform the unconditional branch, and then when we come back, we have to clean up after the arguments. So that's kind of the stuff that we talked about on Tuesday. So I cannot overemphasize, you, you know, some people may say, but Tag, you're nagging again. Well, I cannot overemphasize that we really have to clear all the concepts from the previous class before we start a new class now. Because you know, all the concepts are basically adding on top of each other, which means when the foundation is shaky, it's not gonna be possible, it, it won't be possible to support the extra weight that we're adding on top, okay? Um, so it's really important to kind of make sure that you spend the time and you're putting the effort to understand all the material from a previous class before we start a new class. All right, so having said that, we just have to say push 
So I'm, I'm commenting a little bit here, you know, but you should probably add additional comments you know, to the program. So we push two, which is easy to do, LDIA with two, Dexamin D, STDA, and then we push the first argument, which is eight, okay? So we push eight, same thing, LDIA with eight, Dexamin D, STDA, <clears throat> and then we push the return address. Now that we know the trick of dot six plus, we'll just use that. So push, whoops, push return address. Um, and the way we do it is LDIA with dot six plus, decrement D, STDA, and followed by JMPI to the subroutine, which is called diff. And when it comes back, we have to clean up after the parameters of the arguments. So we have two increment Ds to clean up the stack, you know, so that the arguments are no longer consuming space on the stack. Okay, so I did not add everything that I mentioned as I wrote the program. That is your exercise, okay? So if you get the source code, which you will, because you, if you make a snapshot of the spreadsheet, you get the source code. So you can then look at the source code and then add your own comment on each and every single line because you know, when we're starting off you're know, explaining the concepts, I know it sounds really tedious. It's like adding comments for every single line. Yes, it is actually important to do it you know, at the beginning. Okay? Once you start to recognize your patterns and go like, oh, these three are just pushing eight and these three are just pushing two, I can recognize the pattern, then you don't have to use comments on every single line. You can say this entire block is doing this one thing. But until you have that ability to recognize <clears throat> the patterns of a larger block of, block of code, you still want to kind of put in some effort to comment every single line. And it will even help better, it will help even more if you can relate every single line to the caller callee agreement, because that's, that's the reason why we are doing all this stuff. It has to do with how the caller and the function communicate with each other. So that, that's kind of important. All right, so having said that, we need to define diff now, but just like before, I'm not gonna implement the entire diff. We have diff here, and it will just say, I don't want to deal with all this stuff here. Can I just you know, say return zero? Sure, return zero then. And then we um, do the return sequence, which is LD, BD, or CD, whatever, whichever register you want to use, <clears throat> you just have to be consistent increment D, JMPB in this case. So we're just returning a constant of zero at this point. Why? Because I want to make sure that I can call diff, use the return value of diff to change local variable X of main and have that verified before I do anything else in diff. Okay? So it, it still doesn't hurt to see what is on in diff right now. So in terms of the stack, we now have subtrahend as the byte at the highest address. Then we have minuend as the second highest byte on the stack. And then at the bottom, okay, the last thing that we push on the stack is the return address. So register D should be pointing to the return address at the entry point of div, the way div is set up at this point. So if you want to double check that, okay, the first thing you can do is you simply put a halt instruction here. So if you put a halt instruction here, then the execution of the program will stop on line 14, which means at that point, you can look at register D, which is your stack pointer. You can check that the stack pointer is pointing to the return address. One byte above that is going to be the middle end, which is eight. And then one byte above that should be two, which is our subtrahend. hand. Okay. Okay, so we might as well just do this. Okay, so we are going to leave the halt instruction here and then just you know, run the program as it is right now to double check and make sure that our understanding of what is on the stack is correct. So at this point, it might be helpful for some people, especially people who are visual, to draw a picture. Okay, so I am going to use my tablet to draw a picture. Now, you don't have to use your know, pen and um, writing instrument and paper to write it down. You can use a spreadsheet because all it is is really just a table. But using a piece of paper, you know, may be 
more tactile to some people, you know, it might help you know, with your you know, understanding of the material. So you're welcome to do that too. So what we need here is screen copy.sh. <clears throat> and I'm mo moving the tablet over to here so that we can take a quick look at what should be on the stack right now. All right, so <clears throat> this is location FF, location FE, location FD, FC, FB. I think that should be more than enough bytes that we need here. <clears throat> um, so the way we use the stack is the first one is going to be the return address so that main can return to the beginning code of the entire program. That's what location FF is corresponding to. Location FE is corresponding to local variable X of main. That's going to be using location FE. And then we pushed the two arguments on the stack. The last argument is pushed first, so that means two is should be here. And then the eight should be right below that. And then here we have, an, we have another return address. This one is back to main. This, this one is back to the, the top one, is back to the location you know, that we started off with. So we are expecting the stack pointer or register D to be pointing to location FB at the place where the halt instruction is. All right, so let me just pause, okay? Because this is just me speculating what the program should do. But do we have any questions at this point about why I think this is what the program should do, and these are the co this is the content on the stack right now at the halt instruction. Do we have any questions about that? No questions? Okay. Yep, go ahead. Should we push the argument before? No, we allocate for x first, because the allocation of x has to be done at the very beginning of the function so that we can utilize the local variable in the body of main. So that's why you always have to allocate the local variables at the entry point of the subroutine before you actually implement the body of the function. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there are no questions, we're going to run this code, and then we look at the trace of this. So we switch back to this tool, just up arrow, and then press the Enter key. You can kind of see why your Ripper Spider is is helpful, you know, because otherwise I'll be going through like two minutes worth of you know <clears throat> operations. Now it's all done, you know, easily. Um, let's see, where's my browser? There we go. All right. So we are currently at the halt instruction. According to this trace, we are on, on line eight. So we go back to the assemble tab and see if the halt instruction is indeed on line eight. So the answer is yes. Okay, the halt instruction that we are ending at, nope, we should be not on line eight because, oh, okay, I know what's happened. I forgot to save the code again. There we go. All right. Keep forgetting to do that. Save. There we go. So now we run it again. It should not be the same anymore. There we go. And then we go back to the trace. Okay, so we go to the analysis tab. There we go. So we have more stuff now. But if we go all the way to the end of the program, this is the halt instruction on line 14, so we, we, I think we're at the right place now. Now we go back to the stack and check. Um, what is it pointing to right now? Is it pointing to the return address to main? And according to this, the address is 1F. Go to the assemble tab, and you go to main, and we look at you know, what we are pushing you know, as the return address. It is indeed 1F. Okay, so you know, 1F is the correct return address to main because we can also see 1F is corresponding to the first instruction after the JMPI instruction to div, to div. Okay, one thing done, double check, right? So the next thing is 08, you know, at location FC, 
Okay, that's exactly what we what we did here. And then the next one is a two at location FD. I believe that's also, I'm, I can see right here, it is exactly the way we predicted. And then the next one is going to be um, uh, the return address from main back to the entry code, which is 09, and that is correct as well. We can check that too. Okay, we can check that as well when we go to the assemble tab. And this would be corresponding to this 09 here, which is corresponding to the address of the halt instruction in the entry code. So we, I just double check everything. Okay, so when you're writing your program, this is what might be helpful is to basically break up the whole session of writing the program into small steps. Introduce a few lines, okay? You know, like five, six lines at the most, okay? And then you predict what the program should do with those extra lines, trace it through, make sure it does you know, do what you think it should be doing before proceeding, okay? So I'm just recommending, you know, how to you know, work with this kind of programming at this point of time. So now we can go back you know, to my source code because I have verification of you know, whatever this picture looks like is exactly what it is. So I can now continue with my coding. So according to this, I, saw, I also want to have a local variable called result. Okay? So the stack pointer, after I allocate for result, the stack pointer should now be pointing to result here. So this is where things get a little bit hard to track if I just kind of keep track of, oh, you know, where the stack pointer points to is result. Uh, two bytes above that is the middle end, and then three bytes above that is the subtrahend. So this is where I will start to use um, labels to help me remember the offset from where the stack pointer points to to the various things that are important to me. Okay? <clears throat> so I, I will start to define labels now. Okay, so the label can be something like this. I always use the name of the, of the function as a prefix. So this way you can use, quote unquote, the same local variable name across all the different functions. So it, it's a little bit long, okay? So this is a new form of defining a label because in the, before, when we define a label, there's nothing to the right-hand side of the colon, which means the label is simply defined to be whatever location we are at at this point which is the dot, okay? So without anything on the right-hand side, it is implicitly just the dot. But now we can explicitly say, oh, no, 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 we don't want your diff result to be the location of the LDI instruction that's right after that. We want diff result to be the symbolic name of just zero. So that's how you can define the exact value of a label you know, is simply to give it an expression. All right, so with this, we can now say, what about the next location, the return address? Now, typically, you don't really need to know the address or the offset to get to the return address, but just for the sake of a demonstration, we can do it here, okay? It simply means, you know, this is one byte after that. And then what about the minuend? Minuend is one byte beyond that, so it's div return address one plus, and then div underscore subtrahend is div minuend one plus. So I'm defining each label, except for the first one, as, oh, relative to the one before, this is just one byte after. <clears throat> Which you may not need to do if you want to just say, oh, diff return address is just one, diff minimum is just two, and diff subtrahend is just three, that's fine too. But this illustrates the relative positioning between the items a little bit better than using just constants. Okay. <clears throat> but those are just labels, okay? In other words, at this point of execution of the program, the stack pointer is still just pointing to the return address. I have not allocated for the space for the local variable result. In other words, label definition is an assemble time kind of thing. The actual allocation of you know, locations on the stack is a runtime kind of thing. Those two are independent. So that means, you know, at this point, I still have to put in the code to allocate, decrement D, to allocate for um, local variable result. And then this is just the way that I write code, is I immediately <clears throat> uh, put in the increment to basically do the deallocation, because if I don't do this, I have a tendency to forget. So deallocate uh, result from the stack, 
And then whatever code we need to put is going to be between the decrement D and the increment D because that is when the stack is fully set up as it is described from line 11 to line 14. All right, so are we still doing okay at this point? Yes, kind of, maybe, no, yes. Div, which one is zero? Because that is, okay, after I allocate for the local variable, that's where the stack pointer should be pointing to. Because the local variable is a part of the stack, and since it's the only thing I need as a local variable, so that means after the allocation of the local variable result, the stack pointer should be pointing straight at the last thing that I allocate on the stack, which is result as a local variable. Is that okay or not? Okay. So the most important part, I think the implicit question of what you just asked me is, is everything on the stack? We know parameters are on the stack because you know, they got pushed by the caller. We know the return address is on the stack because that's pushed by the caller as well. So now the next question is, how about local variables? Local variables are also on the stack, but the caller cannot allocate for the local variables because the caller cannot know how many local variables the callee or the function has. So it's up to the function to allocate for its own local variable. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> So now at this point, okay, we can now actually put in the code here. The first thing we need to access is minuan. So now we have a certain pattern to access things you know, once we have these labels in. So we do this kind of thing, okay, LDIC with the label, which is div in this case, uh, minuan. <clears throat> we add the stack pointer to C. That becomes the address. So I will comment this once, okay? But you are probably you probably want to kind of jot down the note and then do the same thing and reason it out when you look at this code. So C has the offset. C is the offset to um, menu end from where D points to. Um, so at this point, C is the address of menu end, <clears throat> and then we have an LD instruction here. LDAC. So now A is the D reference of C, which means it is the D reference of the address of minuan, which means it is the actual value of minuan. Okay, so let's focus on line 24 and the way I commented it. Do we have any questions about that? So this means, you know, you if you cannot remember what is the referencing and what pointers are and what is the ampersand, you know, which is the address of, from CISP 360, now would be a good time to review it. Okay, we have a longer weekend you know, because we have five days before Tuesday. Yeah, five days before Tuesday. So it would be a good time to review those concepts from CISP 360. Okay, pointers, the referencing, the address of, those are the concepts that are really important at this point. And then for people with a Java background, all I can say is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Because <clears throat> I, this is all I can say. Because you know, when people challenge the prerequisite of this class and go like, oh, but I know Java, I, I, there's an obligation that I cannot say no to those particular challenges. Because 401, which is CISP, CISP 401, which is the Java class, is after CISP 360, which means someone who knows Java, as far as our curriculum is concerned, really should know C already. But that really, in reality, that is not the case because you know, Sac State does not teach C++ or C at all. They just use Java. So you know, that's, a, that's a really unfortunate thing. All right, so A is minimum at this point, which means we have <clears throat> the left-hand side of the subtraction. Now we have to move on to subtrahend. It's going to be the same pattern. LDIC with diff subtrahend add cd, 
and then LD B this time because A is really important. I cannot lose the content of A because it is the minor one. So this time I'm going to use B. So I'm just going to shortcut everything and just say that B is now our subtrahend. And now we just have to do a subtraction. We have SUB, AB. So that A is now the uh, difference between those two, which is mean U and mean U and minus subtrahend. And then we have the story back to result. Okay, so, but I don't want to go too far at this point. I want to focus on line 22 and 23. So line 22 is simply saying, okay, whatever the label definition is, we put it into register C, which is really just the offset. So on line 22, okay, register C is the number of bytes between the, the parameter minuend and where the stack pointer is pointing to. It is just the offset from where the stack pointer is pointing to, which means it is not the address of minu n. It's a good step to calculate the actual address, but it is not the address. But since register C on line 22 is the number of bytes between minu n and where the stack pointer is pointing to, as soon as I add the stack pointer to the offset, I now have the actual address of minu n. Does that make sense? Does anyone want me to give you an analogy? I can explain it using a storytelling thing. I've heard that storytelling is a good thing. <laughs> when I was a college student, there was no, no such thing as storytelling, but I will give you guys a story, okay? <clears throat> and I have to pick on an unfortunate student in this class. You guys are going like, no, 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 don't look my way. I'll, I'll pick Marion. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we do is to say, okay, Marion lives you know, five houses down from mine. Okay, that's the offset. That is what the labels are basically trying to say. It's, it's just an offset. Okay, and so Marion is living five houses down the street. So if you want to send anything to Marion, can you just say, oh, just send this you know, to five houses down from where Tech lives, because that's where Maryam lives. Then you kind of need to know where I live, right, to get to the actual address. Where I live is where register D is pointing to. So in order to know the exact house where Maryam lives in, you have to know, you cannot just say, oh, that's five houses down from where Tech lives. That doesn't help you unless you know where I live. So the offset, all of these definitions from line 15 to line 18 are just offsets. So and so lives your know, two houses down from where Tech lives. So and so lives your know, you know, six houses down from where that Tech lives. But exactly where that is, okay? Well, that kind of depends on where I live, right? So if you want to know the exact address to deliver something, then you have to say, okay, this is how many houses down from where Tech lives but this is where tech lives. So when we add these two, now we actually get the absolute address of what you want to access. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next question is, why do we have to do all these calculations at runtime? Why can't we just you know, build everything into the label definition itself? Well, as it turns out, <clears throat> we're all you know, in a traveling circuit. <laughs> so where I live, changes all the time. So you know, basically, Maryam is on a, in a caravan. She's always five you know, cars behind me. And where I go is, uh, today can be Las Vegas, tomorrow it can be you know, Reno, and then the next day can be you know, Tahoe City. <laughs> Sounds like run, right? <laughs> yep, but that's a runtime thing. So where I live is a runtime thing, so that's why you cannot pre-compute everything as a label. All you can say is, well, since tech is moving all the time, and we know, you know where Maryam is relative to tech's car in a caravan, we, when we actually need the address, at that point, we'll find out where tech is using a GPS, and then just say, okay, add five your car links you know, behind that, that's where Maryam is. Is that okay? Is that story kind of helping, or is it making it even more confusing? Okay, most people can only remember circuit. 
you know, after the class and completely forget the context of why we talk about the circuit thing. <laughs> anyway, all right. So we are almost done here, okay? So the sub AB is calculating the right-hand side of the assignment. So now we have to store that to the left-hand side. So we have to figure out where result is. So this is the beauty of using labels is even though minimum end is a parameter, subtract hand is also a parameter, but result is a local variable, now it makes no difference whatsoever because every single label is just a symbolic name of where can we find that thing relative to where the stack point is pointing to. So the way we access result is exactly the same way that we access minimum end and subtract hand. Okay, so we use exactly the same template here. Okay. Um, uh, LDI C with you know, whatever the label is. This time it is result. <clears throat> add CD, which means adding D to C in this case. And then now we have the address. Okay, this time I do want to comment and say that you know, C is now the address of result. So this time we don't want to do an LD. We want, we want to do ST instead because we are storing the right hand side, which is in register A to the address specified by the left-hand side, which is in register C at this point. So that's how we store the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. So I know the next thing we do is really kind of unnecessary, but we're gonna do it. Because the next thing we need to do is line seven, which means go to result, okay? Find out what result is and then use it as a return value. So it's going to be the same thing, okay? I know it is, I just want to make the assembly code to completely resemble the C code. So even though it is completely unnecessary, we'll do it. So this time we need an LD A C so that register A is now the value of result <clears throat> because that's the return value. This, is, this has to do with the um, caller function or caller callee agreement that the return value should always be specified in register A. All right, so I think this is the entire program. Um, there are a few things to check. So if you're not really quite sure whether this is working or not, um, you should put halt instructions into the program just so that it will stop execution at a certain point and you can check whether it is doing everything correctly or not. I would suggest that we put a break here. Okay, we put a halt instruction here. And I would want to kind of check what I should be expecting at this point in the execution of the program. So let me go back to the picture that we had earlier, this picture here. So the difference between now and you know, what the picture was earlier is in addition to, um, okay, let me point out what these things are. I'm gonna use the mouse pointer because I'm not tall enough. Um, yeah, this is Minuan, this is Subtra Hand, this is the return address, but now we have allocated one extra byte for the local variable result. So that means <clears throat> register D should now be pointing to one location lower because we allocated that. And this is where result is. And we have already computed the result and store the six back into the result. So I should be expecting a value of six or zero six at location FA in this case, because this is one byte below FB, okay? So this is what I'm expecting, you know, just an, as an extension of what we talked about already by the time we get, get to the halt instruction. So I can, I can speculate and theorize all I want, but here comes the time to double check it, okay? So now we have to go back to uh, here, make sure I save the file first, and then run the tool again, and then look at the trace, okay? We look at how we update the stack to double check everything. All right, so now we go back here, oh, not here, but the <coughs> browser. We go to analysis again, and then we just, I, I just fast forward all the way to the end here. This is the halt instruction on line 40. We go to the assemble tab and ask, is that the right place to stop? This is line 40 right here. This is the halt instruction. 
which is right after we store something to result. Okay, so that is the right place. Okay, this is in this is how do we retrieve what is in result, which is kind of the same thing. So now we go back to the trace, which is the analysis tab, and we ask, uh, what is in register A? It is a six. Okay, that looks promising, but did we update the stack correctly? The answer is yes, we updated the stack correctly because location FA is now updated to a value of six, which is what it's supposed to do because FA is the address of result as a local variable. So by cross-checking all of these things, the source code, the analysis tab, and also the picture that I drew for myself, and also adding the halt instruction, which allows me to take a snapshot of what the stack looks like at a certain point of the execution of the program. I have now verified everything about this program. Okay, If it messes up and do something wrong later on, I know it is not because of this code. It has to be something else. Is that okay? So that means you know when you are doing your homework assignment, which you are going to get you know, today, you should probably do it in about the same manner, which means you, know, you want to work on a few lines at a time. Make sure that you find a way to verify whether those few lines are doing what they're supposed to be doing before you proceed. Okay, so um, so I can now I, I feel confident enough to go back to the source code and just finish up the program because you know, um, the rest of the program is already done already. Increment D is to deallocate the local variable so that the stack pointer points back to the return address at this point. Um, and then I have to get rid of this line too because this is returning a zero, which is not the intention of the program. And then these three instructions is just returning to the caller. Um, and the caller is main. And I think main has everything done already. Um, nope, I, oh, okay. Main does have everything done correctly already. So this time I'm also expecting local variable X to be updated to a value of six because you know, that's what line 68 is about. So you can kind of compare and contrast the uh, coding of div versus the coding of main. Main doesn't have any uh, labels to um, designate the offset to the various items on the stack. So I'm only relying on my understanding of what the stack should look like to say, Oh yeah, at this point on line 68, the stack pointer should be pointing to the local variable X. But it's difficult to check, right? You know, when you when your program gets longer and longer, it's much better to define the labels as I did with this the function div. But this will still work, okay? It's just not good programming practice in this case. All right. So I'm going to save the assembly code again, run it again. And this time I'm expecting local variable X of main to also update to a value of six. <clears throat> all right, so it's all done. And before we check the trace, we want to theorize, right? So this time we are expecting, let me just use a different color. So this way it is, it stands out a little bit more. So I'm expecting the local variable X of main to also update to a value of six this time because we completed the entire program already. So I'm expecting there's a store to location FE and update the content at location FE to be a six. So this, this is my expectation. And now we go to the um, trace and up the trace and then we just go continue a little bit more and we can see exactly, yep, we update location FE to have a value of six because that is local variable X of main. And then we also check that the uh, stack pointer is quote unquote balanced, which means everything that I allocated for something or eventually deallocated. And we also want to make sure that we halt at the correct location, which is the final halt of the entry code of the entire program. So this kind of concludes my um, exercise you know, to illustrate you know, the few concepts that we are talking about today, which is the concept of a local variable, as well as you know, the concept of dot plus six, or that dot six plus, and also how to access the various items on the stack. Now, there are a few terms you know, that I would also like to introduce. So when we go back to this picture here, there are two 
frames here. So the, the stack space that you use for every invocation of a function is called a frame. So a frame is basically a chunk of space in the stack where collectively they provide the data context of a certain invocation of a function. So in this case, I can now, okay, let me pick a different color, okay, blue. So in this case, these two are corresponding to the frame for main. So I'm just gonna write here, frame for the invocation of main, but I will abbreviate it to just main. These bytes over here, this is the frame for div or for the invocation of div. So each one is a collection of bytes that are contiguous and collectively that chunk of bytes provides the data context of calling a particular function. So that's the concept of a frame. I believe that I talked about the frame um, command in GDB in a previous class. That's basically what it is. Frame zero just refers to the most recent frame, which in this kind of diagram is referring to the one at the bottom, you know, where the stack pointer is pointing to. All right. So let's talk about what you have to do today and also over the weekend, because you know, at this point, I'm giving you guys homework assignments. So let's go back to the Canvas shell. I reorganize things a little bit, you know, but you know, I think it makes more sense now. So let's take a look at the activities that you have to do. So during the lab today, we have you know, parameter and return value. So these two are things that you have to do today. You know, basically, okay, there's it's multiple due dates because someone is sick and you know has to stay home. But for the rest of you, it is due at the usual time, which is 11.50 a.m., okay? So these two are due at the end of the lab you know, session. And then these two is homework. So they are due um, on the 21st, which is next Tuesday, right before class, okay? So you have basically the entire weekend, about four or five days to get these two done. There's some programming involved. So I would get on these as soon as possible. <clears throat> My recommendation is these two over here should not take a whole lot of time. They are fairly, they're, they're relatively simple, multiple choice kind of deal. And I would just kind of get started with this one um, in today's you know, lab session, okay, if you can, so that you can at least you know, have me around you know, if you have questions to ask. The actual programming part is gonna take a little bit longer. So I would do that kind of over the weekend, okay? You'll give yourself a little bit more time to get this done. With that all said, um, I'm looking at the time. We still got some time here. So the other thing I want to do is to illustrate how to use pointers in C. So I'm not referring to pointers as ST and LD. I'm referring to pointers as just regular C concept. So that means I'm gonna write another sample program, okay? So let's go ahead and get rid of these two. And <clears throat> I'll just say, you know, um, post, yeah, post ink, post increment, post ink dot TTPASM. All right, so as usual, I'm gonna write the assembly code first, stdint dot h, and then we have uint eight underscore t post increment, and in order for this to work in C, which has no mechanism of passing by reference, I have to pass by pointer. So this is going to be a pointer to an integer, p int. And then the way we do this is we have to store the value of whatever p int is pointing to, then increment it, and then return the value from before. So there are a, there are a few other ways to do this, but this is the way I choose to do it in today's class. So we just say, you know, old value old value is whatever p int is pointing to, and then we add one to whatever p int is pointing to, so p int plus equal to one, this is called a compound assignment operation, <clears throat> but then we return old value, okay? So in main, 
we basically just get a local variable, okay, u in eight underscore t. Uh, we just call that x and y. Okay, so now we have two local variables. One is x and one is y. We initialize one and say that is six to begin with, and then y is post increment of the address of x return zero. Okay, this is the C code. Do we understand the C code? Can you tell me what Y is supposed to be after line 15 and what X is supposed to be after line 15? Okay, I'll give you a hint. Line 15 is really equivalent to something like that. It is the post increment of x. So what does it mean when we have a post increment operator? Okay, I'll give you I'll give you the result. Okay, you know, because you know, the focus is not to test whether you understand post increment or not. So after this is all done, y should be the value of x before the increment, so that means y should be 6. But because it is an increment, but it's a post increment, so after line 15, x should be incremented to a value of 7. Okay, so that's the expected result. All right, so the focus is going to be on um, post inc, so I'm not even going to talk about the entry code just yet, because I just want to focus on post inc at this point. So post inc is, has a parameter, which is pint on the stack, it has a return address on the stack. It has a local variable old value, which is also on the stack. And after everything is set up, I need the stack pointer to be pointing to old value. <coughs> so I can define the um, um, the labels. So, so post inc um, old value is going to be zero because you know that's the last thing that we allocated on the stack. And then the return address you know is going to be the next thing. Post inc return address is post inc old value one plus and then post inc underscore p int is going to be the next thing which is post inc underscore return address one plus so now after all the labels defined um, we have to decrement d to allocate for the local variable increment d to deallocate it before we return and the return is going to be ldbd increment d jmpb okay so now, between these two, I can actually put in the code. So this is the content, this is the important thing, which is how do we make use of a pointer? So on line six, we have to dereference pint. So we have to do a few things, ldic with um, post inc pint. This is the offset from where the stack pointer points to to get to pint. Add cd, this is now the address of pint. And then we do ldac. This is now register A now has P int, but that is not enough because P int itself is a pointer and we want to access what it is pointing to. So we need another LDAC, LDAA in this case, to get to whatever P int is pointing to. All right. So now we can, now that we retrieve that, we put it into old value. So LDIC with post inc old value, add CD. So C is now the address of old value. And we just need the STCA in this case to store the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So in other words, the main point of this entire exercise is if you have a pointer type and you want to dereference it, how do we do it? Well, it's just one extra LD instruction, okay? But this is also dependent on how well you understand the ST LD versus the LDI instruction versus the CPR instruction. So that means you know, understanding the opcode table, at least knowing what the instruction is doing as opposed to how it is getting it done is really important. It is fundamental to what we are doing now. All right, so let me check the time. We still got five more minutes. I think we can at least you know, finish post ink here. So now we get to the next line, which is you know, adding one to whatever p in is pointing to. Okay, we'll do the whole thing again. Post ink p int. Okay, this is the offset. 
C is now the address of key int. And then we have to do a LDAC. This is now P int. Register A is P int itself. And then we do LDBA. Register B is now whatever P int is pointing to. Add one to it. Oops, increment. And then store that back to whatever P int is pointing to. So that's how we increment something that is pointed to by a pointer. So once again, I did not comment the code because you know I think it probably is a good thing for you to write down the, the comment to explain on this line, when this line is done, what is register, you know, on line 26, for instance, what is register A after this line? What is register B after line 27? What is register B after line 28? And so on. Okay, so I want you guys to write down the comment. You can always rely on the video, which I hope is still going. You can always rely on the video to listen to it and then kind of know, okay, your know, text set, blah, blah, blah. But does it make sense to you? Can you make sense out of what I just said and also the instructions? That's something that you have to do. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so I think this subroutine is done. I'm just looking at the time. I got three more minutes. I think we can finish main too. So main. So we look at you know, what is in main. We have return address because you know, there are no parameters. And then we have x and y you know, after that as the local variables. The stack pointer ultimately should point to x in this case. So since I'm running out of time, well, I can use a, some additional time to do this. Okay, so just give me a little bit more time. Okay, this is zero. I'm just going to shortcut this. This is one. That's all I really need to know. The offsets to local variables x and y. But this time I need to decrement d twice to allocate for the local variables because there are two of them, and increment twice to deallocate before I return. The return code is still the same. LD, LD, BD, increment d, JMPB. All right, so between these two, which means after I allocate for the local variables, I can now do all the stuff that I'm supposed to be doing. LDIA with six, that's the right-hand side of line 14 in C. And then LDIC with main X, uh, add CD, ST, CA. That's uh, what the left-hand side specifies, and we are doing the assignment. So once again, you know, adding comments is going to be kind of a good exercise in this case. All right, the next one is to call post ink with the address of x. Okay, the key is the address of x, not the value of x. <clears throat> so we do the same thing here, LDIC with main x, add cd. That's all we need. We don't need to dereference it because we are passing the address of x and register c now on line 53. Uh, Okay, I cannot, I'm sorry. I accidentally picked up the phone when, I'm, when I really cannot because I'm in class right now. Um, so I, I have to explain to the other person later on. Um, right, that, okay. So this needs to be pushed on the stack. I'm gonna have to <laughs> decline the call. <clears throat> uh, decrements. D, okay, because we're pushing C on the stack. So STDC. So we're pushing the address of X on the stack right now. And then we have to push the return address, LDIA with dot six plus, decrement D, STDA, JMPI to the subroutine, which is post inc. When it comes back, we have to uh, increment D to deallocate the argument, which is the address of x on the stack. Register A now has the result of post ink. I need to store that to local variable y. So LDIC with main y, add cd, stca. So that finishes the assignment operation on line 15. And now your main can deallocate the local variables and return to the entry code. All right. So once again, before I run this code, I have to kind of know what is happening on the stack. So let's go back to the tablet. Okay. 
All right, so let's check out in this case what is happening on the stack. Location FF is the return address to the um, entry code. And then below that is going to be Y, and then below that is going to be X. And then below that is going to be the address of X. So we know what that is because this is FE, this is FD, and this is FC. So that means at location FC, we should see FD in it. Okay, so the content of location FC should be FD, which is the address of X, you know, which is a local variable of main. And then below that, we have the return address to main. So this is return address to main. And that's the last thing that we are pushing. Oh, no, we, we got more stuff here. This is old value. So old value is at location. This is FB. This is location FA. Um, and then according to the C code, we initialize x to 6. So this should start with a value of 6, which means old value should ultimately become 6. But then y is going to be 7. Uh, this should update to 7. And then y should update to 6. So this is what I'm expecting that should be happening you know, on the stack because of the operation in C. In other words, to come up with this picture has nothing to do with understanding TTP ASM, the programming language. It only has to do with how the stack is utilized in order to implement the C program. Is that OK? All right. So the assembly instruction, which is um, you know, what is on the right hand side here, that's just the stuff that makes this happen. But we should know what to expect. What is the result that we want to see before we you know, specify the code to do it? All right, so I'm doing something that I preach, you know, do not do because I just finished writing what 70 something lines before I test it. <laughs> so maybe it will work, maybe it won't work. We'll see. Oh, this is not the right program, is it? It's still using the local one. Okay, let's do it again. This time it's called post ink. All right, so let's do that one more time. Post ink. All right. <laughs> All right, so it's all done. What do you think? Do, do you think you know, it, it did it correctly, or do you think your know, tech probably made some mistake and the program didn't work? Oh, it didn't work. Did not work. <clears throat> How do I know it didn't work? Because the JMPB instruction is jumping to a La La Land location, which is 6E. OK. Do you want me to spend some time to debug this? Well, we, we're still before you know, 10.30. I, still, we, I think we still got some time. OK, so we want to check whether the program did everything else correctly. And I can tell right away it's wrong, because it really should not be changing location 2 to 0, 3. Um, so something is terribly wrong in this case, because I did not jump around the subroutine. <laughs> oh, that is so bad. That is so bad, because I've I did not have the actual entry code here. So the no op, um, LDID with a zero, and the actual call of the subroutine of main, I completely missed that part. So I, you know, because the first thing it did was this one here, which is totally the wrong thing to do. All right, okay, so that's my bad. Definitely I forgot, completely forgotten to do this. So we have to call main from here, LDIA with dot six plus, um, push it, Declan D, STDA, JMPI to main, come back and do a halt here. So that's the proper entry code. Okay, let's find out whether this fixes the problem or not. And as it's doing this, I want to kind of ask how many people how many people know how to use a revision control program like get GitHub ish. Okay, so that can be helpful in this program because you you're writing a few lines of code and then you're gonna check it. So it's good to check in the program you know, when it is done correctly. So this way you have a, a place to fall back on, you know, when the program does not do what it is supposed to be doing. All right, so I am just checking. Okay, so let me put, pop the um, this thing here. So we are now checking 
did we write a six to location fd, which is local variable x of main? Yes, we did. Very good. So we just kind of scroll forward. Um, fc, location fc is storing the value of fd because that's the address of x. Yep, that's what we expected, and that's what it did. Excellent. So we have 3, 2 at location fd. Um, that's the return address to main. Looks about right to me. Okay, we can double check that if we wanted to. And then eventually we should see fa changing to a 6 because it is the old value. And then after that, it just does a whole bunch of stuff, you know, that has no memory uh, writing, uh, except location fd should update to a 7. That's the next update because that's the actual increment. We got that. And then we return back to main shortly after that. Then we update location fe, which is local variable y of main, to 6 as the return value of the whole thing. And ooh, that is incorrect. OK. OK, so what is wrong here is because I forgot to dereference x. This is the address of x. I forgot one extra ld to dereference it. So one more fix to the program. All right, so we got close, really close. So all of that has to do with when we return, we forgot to return the value of uh, old value. So I completely forgot you know, this entire statement on line 8. So that's my fault you know, because I forgot. Um, so LDIC with um, post ink old value, add CD. Uh, this time we have to remember to do LD A C. Now this time register A is important because register A is what we use to return a scalar, and that's exactly what we need to do here is to return the value of old value as the return value of the subroutine of the function. All right, so save, go back and rerun the program, and we can. It's still updating. There we go. All right. So move down here. Yep. So we are returning six this time. And uh, returning six because the register A is a six over here. That specifies the return value. And then the you know, FE is local variable Y, which gets a value of six. Just two more things to check. We need to make sure the stack pointer is back to zero, zero, and then we are halting using line seven. So all of those are you know, doing the way they're supposed to. All right, so I know this is a long lecture and this is a lot of stuff, okay? Which means you might need to go back and watch the video again. I will uh, send you the source code. If I forgot to do that in previous classes, just remind me because I think I still have all of those today. All right, so. Do you remember what you need to do? You know, because today is a little bit special because you have you know, two um, activities for the lab time and then you have the homework and the, the code submission of the homework that are due on next Tuesday at 9 a.m. So a little bit more stuff to do than usual, but I think the homework assignment should help to kind of connect all the concepts. All right. So are there any questions before I stop the recorder? We are still recording right now, which is good. Yep. Oh, the access code. I completely forgot about that too. All right, so the access code of the first one is frame. I'm going to write it down. So we got frame for the first lab activity. And then we have... Second one of the lab activity. It's framed. <laughs> so we have frame and framed. There we go. All right. All right. Anything else? Anything else that I forgot? Okay, I hope not. I'm going to stop the recorder now so the people who are